uh, like one tray is about 150 plants. And yeah. then uh, we're going to kick and then we're going to plant them double the density because we know there's going to be a bunch of males. We're going to kick them yeah. to flower, select out the males, flower them like 90% of the way and then do a reveg on whichever ones we like. So that's the model. And, and then the product that we get out of it, we're going to make it like a special skunk blend or like some kind of a, it'll be multiple phenotypes mixed together, maybe even just a pre-roll or something. But the plan uh -huh. is, is to start with a, a select number of plants. That's a wide enough breadth to be able to like, or breadth to be able to get, make a selection. I find that starting with a 10 pack is like, not great. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, let's no, say you start with a shit. pack of seeds. It's ridiculous, right? The retail seed business has been very uh, challenging to do, to uh, include in a commercial production. So by starting with a good base, like let's say we get 75 females, then, you know, of that, you would expect that we would get two, three, four, five winners. And when we, once we re-veg those, uh, we always start from a single plant as well. Uh, we know yeah. that we have fingerprinting technology through our partners at Segre International. On your process, when you first start, when you're going to be selecting for seed, at yeah. what, yeah. what point do you flower the seed plant off at? Because I always follow old timer ones rule, and I don't know if science or your experience or your data, or whatever, backs it up. I can see the sense of, and something I just always do do, which is to before flowering the, the seed plant, uh, I let it reach like five or six weeks. It starts shows, showing the, the sexual maturity without being flowered. And as soon as you see, a, see its sex, then you can flower it and knowing it's reached its full genetic potential. That's what old time one used to say. I don't disagree with that. I mean, often and seedlings will be like... to conclude after that when you once you've got a clone of that plant, you can obviously flower it the minute it's got roots. But before yeah. taking cuttings or before flowering, the first time you would always let the plant reach its sexual maturity and uh, display it without being flowered. You know, pre-flowers. I, I think um, so. My experience is like we, we definitely flower out seedlings earlier than that. But if you're yeah. looking to get like the best expression. Uh, you definitely want to wait until all the seedlings have like their true leaves. So like yeah. five to seven to nine points. Often when they start, and especially if you've got some phenotypes that are sensitive to nitrogen, for example, they'll push like one point, maybe three points. And those mutations are not typical of the high yielding plants, right? You don't often see like mutated leaves being valuable production plants plants so by allowing them to veg up to a certain size you get a understanding of which ones likely are going to make it through the process now that said i've been flowering seed only for quite a while now and uh we like to kick them small and lot in a high density so they don't veg for five weeks even there may be three including germination so like you know a week in the plug two weeks in the in the block and then move them to their bags uh, we're trying to shorten that even because we're finding that the density is, you know, they put on a lot, some varieties specifically, they put on a lot of size once you trigger them to uh, generative growth, right? You reduce that photo period and they double or triple in size. Yeah. So th they're going to put on a lot of biomass once you trigger them. And uh, But if you're like trying to characterize, we call it, uh, phenotypes, a longer veg is better to weed out anything that's not likely to be viable um so yeah, i don't I disagree I, with that stick with it. I like it i don't think it's too long to wait really and i, I yeah i feel i'll probably stick with that myself i just that's what i do as soon as i see see their sex the little ball forming or a little the first female sign, <clears> i'm <throat> happy then to flip the flower you know yeah but it's tough though when you're when you're dealing with thousands of plants to yeah, look at yeah, yeah. everyone in the nodes it's like we uh we tend to push them a little further. Um, what what I'm finding is that the males are or hermaphrodites are much more sneaky than I remember as a youth. So mm -hmm. we went through and we pruned a whole room, and then where we had pruned, like just the uh, the sucker sucker thinning right from the bottoms. So we just did this last week, and then we went through afterwards, and we were having a conversation about irrigation strategy. And I looked over and there was like a male flower coming right out of the stalk of one. So I couldn't explain it. I was like, why is, so we just pruned this. And then this tissue pushed out of where we pruned. 
Like that is not something I've seen before. And it makes me question uh, the stability of these lines, not yours, but like this other vendor, because uh, that's really scary. It doesn't take a lot of pollen to make a lot of seed. Like every grain yeah. of pollen has the potential to become a viable seed if it yeah. hits the female stigma, right? So uh, that means that one little male flower, one little banana, a lot of people call it, could be yeah. hundreds of seeds, right? Yeah. Thousands even. So it is a really uh, a challenging environment when you have thousands and thousands of plants all from seed to try to keep the pollen at bay, um, which is why I think it's really interesting, the research and the, the work that's being done with like the diploids, triploids. I was talking to cannabis breeders. I've been doing it for 20 years, California, Washington, BC. And uh, one of the things... I'm going to ask you guys actually is how do you select your males? Like we had, let me back up. We had just discussed open pollination previously uh -huh. and open pollination is when you take a group of seeds and you allow them all to grow and all the males to pollinate the females. And it makes a fruit salad of seeds. It's, you know, not just two sexual partners. It's like a real orgy of sexual partners and they're all sharing DNA and their offspring is a real mix of, uh, of uh, progeny so uh, that is how it basically used to be done and then breeders figured out oh if we just if we select one male and pollinate one female it produces one genotype and many different phenotypes so i've often asked because we know what desirable traits are in female plants the nice smell big yield great effect easy to grow fast makes your dick bigger whatever it is right so um i often ask breeders how do you select your males male selection like obviously so we'll cut back to that now rich how obviously for male selection the key thing is going to be progeny testing but you're asking in yes. the initial i guess in the initial selection before you get to the point of testing this progeny and then seeing if the results indicate a worthy male but all the traditional things really that i suppose a lot of people say does it have pungent tips do you, i like the structure of it the morphology um do i like the flower shape that kind of thing. all these kinds of you know it's individual traits i guess that's what i'm looking for um you, I like nailed it, though. You, you, you nailed it the first thing you said is actually the answer because we it's not a correlation between the shape the terps and the structure uh or the flower density in a male plant necessarily to their offspring. And the way that one of my friends explained it to me, he's like, yeah, all of Einstein's kids were idiots, right? So it doesn't, it's not necessarily like this is gonna be that. Um, there's some of the DNA is shared, but when it's combined with the female DNA, it doesn't always correlate so directly. So the correct answer is growing out the progeny. Yeah, and yeah, the hard the thing way. about I mean, that, that is truly the only way and the only thing that matters ultimately has gotta be but, yeah, yeah, and Most but keep, people, but keep. They don't often have the luxury, perhaps, of being able to do that. I mean, they should and strive to, but yeah, when people, most people are selected a male to breed with to begin with. I mean, before it gets to that progeny testing, then they're, they're looking for how it looks and how it smells a lot of the time, and I'm no different. I, if it, you know, a lot of my breeding is sense based and intuitive. I, how it. The, that appeals to me on a lot of levels, you know. And so an, I do, another I do, sorry, I, was sorry. Just say, I do find I'm fortunate in what the offspring tend to be. I and when I mentioned the structure, I, I like a lot of probably it's old timer one's original kind of um uh structure that he liked to select it for too, but there's a lot of strong, strong looking plants or male plants which I will select over any kind of you know long internodal spacing or weak fucking stems that kind of shit you know or thin yeah. stems yeah so and and that's just it is that when we talk about the dna fingerprinting technology it becomes very valuable in these breeding situations because you can it's a hundred dollars a test so it's not crazy money it becomes a bit expensive when you're talking about thousands and thousands of plants right then it's a cost prohibitive Mm -hmm. But what you can do is, let's say you've got your batch of seeds 
and you select the male that you like based on your intuition, you make the offspring and then you grow out the progeny. Like yep. that is two flowering cycles and a drying and two drying cycles and two veg cycles. So retaining a male plant in a vegetative state is probably not possible. A lot of males will just start flowering too, right? Like they'll start pushing bananas in, in veg in veg. So it's very difficult to keep a male for like nine months in your facility because it might have value. So what you do instead is you fingerprint those males before you make that batch of seeds, destroy the male, knowing that you can find that phenotype again using fingerprinting. After your nine months or a year, once you've grown up the progeny and made your selections, you go back to that initial lot of seeds, germinate them, and find that male again using DNA fingerprinting. That's a way to really elevate your game as far as keeping males in your ecosystem without having to run the risk of cross-pollination that's not um, desired, right? So the DNA fingerprinting as a utility, it also allows you when you're producing seeds at scale to select out the less desirable females. So we have a bunch of F1s, for example, we get like two to three phenotypes in there. If we were going trying to des select for desirable traits because one of those phenotypes is much more bulky and has more agronomic value, before they even start flowering, we can select out the plants that we don't uh, think are desirable, uh, which is, again, another huge leap forward because um, generally the way we've done it in the past is you have your inbred lines, you constantly inbreed them to stabilize them, and then you make an F1 from that that produces a more stable seed base than uh, just like a um, another hybrid. Uh, you still get that hybrid vigor from those F1s, but you have less phenotypes, so they're more commercially viable. Yeah, you know, our vegetable seeds, for example, they're not like you buy a package of beefsteak tomato seeds and you don't see 30 different types of tomatoes. Um, that's because they've done the same thing where they inbreed them, produce F1s, and then the, the seed is the first generation is very stable. Now, if you were to hybridize or grow out the seed from that crop, they would be a polyculture. Um, but yeah, the, when you're talking about males, selecting for desirable traits is the progeny. It's, and that's something that is, and I've been asking that question for 20 years, and only two people have come at me with that, you being one of them, Blue. So like, that's that's a big um, big advantage, and it speaks to your ability in your seed distribution company, because you've got strong lines that have been insulated, because it takes a little longer, but you don't harbor clones and grow them for three months to wait to find out that half of them are going in the garbage, taking up all that space. Mm -hmm. So by yeah. adding a little bit more time on the reveg side, it's a much more streamlined process. Uh, we also like to, uh, if we can, we'll like label, once the plants are vegging, we'll take a shoot, we'll label it with the plant number and just put in a cup of water, toss that in the flower room. So that way we can cycle out, we can select out a bunch of the males to just, uh, just before we even uh, trigger them to flower. Cause that's, you know, that can be um, a bunch of extra space too. But uh, yeah, I mean, I'm excited to do the phenol hunt as well, because once we start that process and get visibility of what we like, we can really have some unique things that, uh, and that is really what sells right now. Like it, when you're selling into the black market or into, uh, I guess say like other less regulated markets, strain name really is the, what drives, um, you know, sales. But when we get into the regulated market, basically all of the specific variety uh using one single male you might be discarding things that have some value right so oh, it, it's more yeah. time you know but you just do it in one tent you just let them rip let them you build that population back up and then you phenol hunt again and make those selections because again back to the male conversation i think that males are overlooked in the overall breeding process there's a lot of femmes out there and the reason why there's yeah. feminized seeds is because we're taking a desirable plant and hybridizing it with a desirable plant. Um, and that's great. However, uh, there is a, especially with a lot of the cookies type stuff, a lot of Hermes come from fems because yeah. they're not stable to begin with. So you can't take some hype cut, reverse it and uh, cross it with another hype cut and feel confident that you've got stable genes. So there's uh, definitely... 
some work to do when it comes to characterizing plants and deciding what to breed with specifically on the male side. And yeah, looking at the progeny and then making new hybrids after you've inbred them a couple of generations is really the way to make commercial seed. Um, the retail stuff that's been sold, breeders have not been um, rewarded for producing, you know, like very uh, consistent seeds, homogenous seed, because phenol hunting is part of the part of the game in cannabis, like the unique stuff, discarding things. Uh, moving forward, though, I think we're going to see more F1s made from IBLs and uh, more of that commercial consistent seed stock because veg and mothers is expensive, especially at scale, right? T tissue culture is expensive and growing large amounts of vegetation to make cuttings is also expensive on the bottom line for large commercial operations. So I, I do foresee uh, seed propagation or sexual propagation being more a part of uh, cannabis horticulture like it is you know, traditional horticulture. Um, and now yeah, I'm excited because my plan is to get some of your selections set aside and then dis 